Okay, so now we've got our software installed. Uh, I want to show you how to do some basic Fortran programming. Fortran is a pretty good programming language. It's been around for a long time. Uh, there have been some updates to it. It's not, um, I, I would claim it's easier to use than something like uh, C, even C++. Um, there are some peculiarities with Fortran. It's very good at crunching numbers. It's not very good at graphical displays, although there are some some tools and things you can get for having uh, windows pop up and such. But basically, it's it's a good uh, calculator. And I, I like to teach this, uh, even though it may not be a, as popular as it once was, I do like to teach Fortran because it helps people think in a, in a logical fashion. The computer does exactly what you tell it, nothing more, nothing less. And if you have a, a nice logic flow to your thought, then you can code a, a program pretty easily. All right, so I am going to work in a folder on my hard drive uh, called uh, Test Code 2. And I'll send you this uh, sample program. I'm going to open sample.for up. And in Crimson Editor, if you use it a lot, it can be just a little bit confusing. If you open up the sample.4, uh, it's going to also load every other file that you have recently used. And that may not be the ones that you want. So I'm going to go over here to sample.4, and I'm going to right-click on this, and I'm going to select close other so that we only have sample.4 that's up. That, that's one little confusing thing about uh, the Crimson Editor, but... But other than that, it's it's a really pretty good uh, program. You can even record macros and things like that in this text editor. So in this uh, sample.for program, and I'll send this to you, it uh, contains almost every useful Fortran command that I can think of. So the very first thing that your program uh, has to start off with is a statement called program. All right, so that's here in the blue line. I'll highlight it. And then after that comes the name of your program. And I just put examples for the name of my program. <clears throat> if you have a comment, comments must start with a character in the first column. Okay, you can't have a C anywhere else, or but whatever you put in here, C, X, a star in the first column means there's a comment. And your interpreter, your compiler will not uh, interpret anything after this line. Uh, any Anything in the columns after this first column, if it's filled. And in here, it's a good idea to put the name of your program, uh, what it's about, maybe what some of your variables are, what the purpose of your program is. So documentation is, is always very good, and that, that can't be emphasized enough. Now we're going to talk about something called fixed format Fortran. And in fixed format Fortran, where things go uh, is very important. If you notice in this line here, I have the C for my comment. Then I have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. And then I have that repeated all the way out to here. So comments are any lines that have a character in position number 1. Columns 2 through 5 are for reference numbers or statement numbers. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Column 6 is reserved. Spelled that wrong. For a continuation character, in case you have something that spills over into a couple lines. Um, any character except zero can be used in the continuation column. And I'll caution you, uh, you generally do not want to use tab to get over to column six. Use spaces because uh, the Fortran compilers can interpret the tab differently than spaces. So in Fortran 77, fixed format Fortran, programming statements must be in column 7 or later and must not extend past column 72. So here's why I have this stopping at this digit 2. If you count these up, there are 72 characters in this line. When I do my programming, I do not want to have my lines any longer than this column. And this thing can be copied and placed anywhere just to check. Uh, inside of uh, Crimson Editor, 
There's also down at the bottom, tells you what line number you're on. It tells you what column number you're at. So here, if I exceed column 72, I can check over here and find out. All right, the next thing that we would have in a Fortran program are, or, uh, are our variable declarations. Go So good programming practice is to declare all of our variables. If a variable is not declared, then it could be assumed to be what's known as a real number or an integer, depending on what the name of it is. If it starts with an A through H or an O through Z, those are reals. I through N, if you notice, those are the first two letters in the word integer. I through N are assumed to be integers. Uh, variables in Fortran 77 must start with a character, not a number and it can be no longer than six characters or numbers. Now, some of the Fortran versions now um, allow you to do more than six characters, but if you're trying to stick to strict Fortran 77, you'll just use six characters. All right, so here are some ways to uh, define some terms. Here's a real number, A. This is a vector that is uh, got 10 elements in it, B a vector, a real vector with 10 elements, C, and then all of these A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, K and K2 are real numbers. If you want to define something that's double precision, that works in the same way. Uh, double precision has more uh, bits to represent the number than single precision or real numbers, uh, as we've discussed in class. If you want a character, the way that it is defined is you have some variable name and then star 25, meaning that character can be up to 25 characters long. If you want to define something as an integer, you can do that as integer i or j, and that integer array would be e10. Of course, you can have uh, bigger arrays. You can have 10 by 10 arrays or whatever. In order to do something like that, you would put comma a... Uh, in I want a, a new name and then I go 10 comma 10 so that's a 10 by 10 array and I look down here and I am not exceeding 72 characters so that's fine if I do exceed 72 characters I can hit enter <clears throat> I can start a new line I can explicitly define the character <clears throat> L as a real and put it in there as an array of 10 elements. All right. Next thing we'll look at is how to uh, interface with our program. We want to be able to write something to the computer screen. This is the command to write something. Write star comma star you see the single quotation mark, this is a screen print. And then the single quotation mark means that that will write that to the screen. Star comma star means to the console or the screen. Now, uh, Fortran programs have to be compiled and then we can execute them. So nothing happens uh, until you compile and execute it. So we're just putting in our commands. This is maybe a little bit different than some more modern languages that are interpretive. They can tell if you're making mistakes as you type them. Uh, this, you don't know about your mistakes until after you give it a try. All right, so here I'm declaring a couple values for variables. A, 10.78. A1 is A times 1.0. And J is equal to A1 times 1.0. <clears throat> now, something we have to point out. Since we have defined J is an integer up here, will have a truncated value. J should be equal to 10 because of that truncation. So making something an integer will truncate, not round the number. In strict Fortran 77, multiplying a real number with an integer will result in truncation. So if I want to, this is very important, if I want to multiply real numbers by real numbers, I need to put the decimal point in my factor that I'm multiplying that real number by. That's why I have A times 1.0. In strict Fortran 77, if I put A1 is equal to A times 1, 
without the point zero behind it. It will interpret that as an integer truncation. All right, and then the next line here, it writes to the screen a comma a1 comma j. Now this will space over a, a tab or five characters with a comma. So when we print this out, we should see something for a and then a1 and then j. And, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Multiplications and divisions and powers work pretty much in the usual way. One thing you have to be careful about is taking something to a power. If I want to take uh, and make a squared, then I use two stars. A star star 2.0 means a squared. Addition works the usual way, a plus a. Uh, if I want to take and uh, do subtraction, that works the usual way. Now, whenever you have um, multiplication and subtraction in the same term, multiplications happen first and then subtractions have to happen afterward. So there's no parentheses in this, but what this will do is we'll take 2.0 times a, it'll take 0.5 times a, and then it will subtract the result to give you a4. Division is with a slash. And here, this statement will write out those variables that we just defined. <clears throat> now let's take a look at something called a do loop. Okay. The way a do loop works is it uh, loops through a sequence of statements until the conditions for the do loop are satisfied. So in this do loop, I am going uh, do 500, that means line 500. Remember the line symbols has to start in column two uh, through five. So this is line 500 right here. It says I equal one to 10, excuse me. And then the second uh, step is one. So B I is equal to A times the real number of I. So this converts the integer I into a real number and multiplies it by A. C I is equal to A times I, which takes this and multiplies it by an integer I. D I takes A, multiplies it by 2.0 times I converted into a real number. And EI takes and makes this a result DI and takes the integer portion of that. And then I write all of these things out and then we see what we get out of that. So it takes and repeats this loop where I changes from a value from 1 to 10. After that loop, then uh, it just writes uh, 4.7. I don't know why I have that in there. Uh, just writes another variable. Uh, this is for the next part of using these uh, uh, comparison operators. So if you want to do uh, checks on variables, if something is bigger than something else, then do something else. Then you can use this statement. It's an if, then, else, and if statement. So the way comparisons are done is you have to put them in parentheses like this. If K is less than or equal to, LE stands for less than or equal to 3.0, then it will do this. Otherwise, if that condition is not true, then it will go and do this statement. So the, the conditional statement operators are LT for less than, GT for greater than, LE for less than or equal, GE greater than or equal, or EQ is equal. You need to use those in your if then else and if statements. Good programming practice is to indent these an appropriate amount. So there are all these statements are at the same level. Uh, the Fortran compiler doesn't care what you do uh, as far as that is concerned, but uh, if you want to make this more readable, then you would you would do that. If you want to use some Boolean operators and or or not, then you would set them up this way. You have a conditional statement here at the beginning, another conditional statement here in parentheses at the end, then you put them together with the dot and dot 
in parentheses. So this statement would say if k is greater than 4.0 and if k is less than 6.0, then write these two statements. This is just an if, then, and if. There's no else to this. All right, let's take a look at some file input and output. We can open a file. The way you do that is uh, this statement, open unit number, and I just chose 12. You can put whatever you want in there, whatever number, comma, file equal, the single parenthesis, uh, sample dot that. That will be our file name there. And so I write to this file, 12 comma star. The star means an unformatted output. And then I, I write the text, unformatted output. And then I write the value for K. Below that, I write to that file some text that says formatted output. And then the formatted output, I have uh, writing into unit 12, 900 is my format statement. And I'm writing the value of K, writing value of K again, integer value of K, and then this thing that I've uh, initialized earlier called E character. Let's see if what that is up at the top. If I can find that. Let's just do a search. Okay, this is a string. Okay, there it is right there. So that character, this is a string. It can be no longer than 25 characters as we defined it up in the top. All right. Now, if you close the file, then uh, that's the close statement. I'm closing file 12. You should always close your files before you stop your program. All right, now I'm going to open this file as unit 14. Open 14 file is equal to sample.dat status equal old. Okay, uh, status tells me that that file is already an old file. It should already exist. If it doesn't exist, the program will stop with an error. Now I'm going to read ecar and k2. And then I'm going to write ecar and k2 out of the file. These should be the first two things that we put in. Okay, then I'm going to close unit 14. Let's take a look at our format statement. Format statement is uh, identified by line 900. You can only have lines, uh, you can have repeated line 900s. So if you have a different format straight statement, that would be like 901 or 902. Some people like to put their do loop lines in one sequence of numbers and their format statements in another. But the way the format statement works is uh, as follows. If you look at this line that I've just highlighted, F6.2. This is a floating point number that is six digits long and has two decimal places. So that's how it'll point out, print out. 10x means 10 spaces. F6.1 is a floating point decimal that has one number behind the decimal point that's six digits. Uh, the field is six characters wide. Now that six characters includes the decimal point and the numbers after the decimal point. So a 6.1 could only have four numbers in front of the decimal point because the point one takes up two of those digits of the field. I5 is an integer that's five digits long. We have a five uh, space and then A5. A is a character, so I'm only going to print out five uh, characters of my number uh, of e car. All right, I'm not going to save this, uh, but I have it saved previously. I'm going to exit out of my Crimson Editor, and I am going to go and open up a DOS command window. And I'm going to go into the place where my test code is at. There it is, sample.4. Now I've installed G95 already. You need to have installed that. See the previous video if you haven't. 
I'm going to type in G95, and I'm going to put in the name of my program, sample.for. I'm going to hit enter. Okay, so it's compiled it. If you had any errors, those errors would pop up at that time. Sometimes those errors are simple to understand. Sometimes they're pretty cryptic. Well, let's see what we have in our directory right now. All right, now the name of your program is called a.exe. I don't know why it calls it a.exe, but that's what it calls it. Uh, it's possible to copy it under a new name if you want. Uh, but we're just going to execute it at the command prompt. I'm just going to type in the symbol A and hit return. So here's what we have. Let's compare this output to what we have in our Fortran program. I'm going to load this back up in our Crimson Editor. scroll down. So the first thing I wrote was this is a screen print. Okay, you see it right there in the on the screen. The next thing is we wrote A, A1, and J. Okay, 10.78, 10.78 in here because we multiple we said that J was an integer. It only prints out as 10. Okay, very important thing to keep keep note of. All right. It writes out to the screen those three values. Then now it writes out uh, a squared. That's this number. A plus a. Now here, here it has two times a minus 0.5 a and uh, 5.39. Let's just check this uh, line right here. Let's understand how this works. Let me pop up a calculator. All right, if A is 10.78, and we're going to multiply that by 2, all right, and now it's going to this is 53.9, and now we're going to take 10.78, and we're going to multiply it by 0.5. Oops. 5.39. Alright, so let me write that down. Oop, I did something wrong the first time. 10.78 times 2 is equal to 21.56. And now we're going to subtract 5.39 we get 16.17. Okay, so uh, just to emphasize the order of operations, does multiplications and divisions first, and then does additions and subtractions subsequently, unless you explicitly use parentheses in your expression. Okay, now it takes A2 and divided by A3, and here we got 5.39. All right, and then we wrote those things out. All right, let's take a look at our do loop. It writes a couple of blank lines, and then it writes, this is the do loop. And it does i equal to 1 to 10. Okay, first off, it prints a times the real part of i. Oh, for, first it prints i. And then now it takes a times the real part of i, so it multiplies it by 1.0. Okay, it takes C and multiplies it by 1.0. Now here it did not truncate it. Some versions of Fortran do truncate. Here it takes A times 2 
times the real part of i, and you get this number. And then now it takes the integer portion of the previous number, so now it truncates it and leaves us with 21. And you'll see how it does this. It goes from i is equal to 1 through 10. puts all of this in that uh, on the screen here. Okay, so you see how it truncates. It does not round. It truncates all those numbers. All right, so now then it uh, says k is equal to 4.7. And then uh, since k was equal to 4.7, it goes into this loop, you know, this if-then-else statement, and it says uh, it must, be, must have been greater than or equal to 3.0 to get to this part, and it is. It goes into this next section and it says um, must be greater than 4.0 as it checks for these conditions. Now the next thing it does in the program is it opens this file, and the file is in that same directory as uh, everything else, sample.dat. Now I'm going to open this with Crimson Editor as well. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me open it with WordPad so we can see it with the program at the same time. So it wrote <clears throat> 2 unit 12 unformatted output. Then it wrote the value of k. Then it wrote formatted output and it is writing according to the format statement. It writes an f6.2. Notice that's two decimal points, two decimal places behind this number. It wrote the value of k as it is natively 4.7. It wrote the integer version of k, 4, and then it is writing ecar. Now ecar is actually 25 characters, but we only told it to output the first five in that sentence. So it is THIS and um, a space. So here you have how to do read statements, write statements, and so forth. Uh, we're gonna, gonna pause here for just a moment and then we'll take a look at how to incorporate a subroutine into all of this. All right, so in my same uh, folder, I've got a subroutine. Um, and we're going to look at this one, nr.4. And I'll load it up, and I'll show you how to use the subroutine. This is newton ratson iteration. And uh, we can talk about this a little bit in class. But the main thing I want to show is that in order to uh, do a subroutine, Oops, this is this is without the subroutine. In order to do a subroutine, we need to call it. Uh, and I guess what I should show you is the file that says subroutine.4. All right. So in my main program, I got my program statement, and I need to have my end statement. I think we talked about that in a moment uh, the, the previously, but the end statement must be in every... Fortran program it tells it when it's a stop. If you want to call a subroutine, you call it subroutine by the subroutine name, and then these are the arguments that go in and out of the subroutine. This subroutine calculates strain for a given level, uh, calculates stress for a given level of strain in an equation. So I define the strain value, and then the sigma is something that comes out of it. The way I call a subroutine is the statement call, nr, and then my arguments. And then in the same text file, it's probably the easiest way to do this, I have the statement subroutine nr, and it defines the subroutine. The subroutine statement stops with an end statement, just like your program does. It knows it's a separate thing. You uh, but the variables are independent. The only thing that links the variables in the subroutine in the main program are what goes through the calling function. So I can define uh, the same variables here. It doesn't affect previously unless they're in this, this call statement. So I have all these things declared. I do my calculation. 
And then this return statement means that I return to the calling program. And it will bring back in uh, the values for epsilon and sigma. It may change epsilon and it may change the value of sigma, but now you can come out and you can uh, write this in here. Now, another thing I want to show you is that if you make plots using Excel, here's a very handy command. You open a file and you call it something.xls for an Excel file. And uh, you can write to the Excel file with the the unit command. I'm opening unit 12. And if you put your variable comma, you see this says character 9. That is a tab character, comma, sigma. This will import into Excel is two columns. That tab character lets Excel know that you have one column and another column. So that can be very handy if you want to make a quick chart. You just print out your values from your Fortran program into this tab delimited text file, open it with Excel, and then you can get right to business. All right, the very last thing I want to talk about is this program that I wrote using the LA Pack routines. Now, if you're very good with, with programming languages and you know how to use make files, you can compile all of those subroutines from LA Pack. And knowing the function names, you just call your function names. I'm going to take a little bit different approach. I'm going to put all the subroutines that we need from LA Pack and dump them into a file, just like I did with this subroutine here. And then um, we'll just compile it. Now there's a little, you know, a few, couple little things you have to watch out for when you take that approach. You have to make sure every subroutine that is called is into your main file. For example, let's make a file. Um, it calculates something to do with a matrix. Now let's let's see if we can figure out which LA pack routine that we might want to use. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to try to find uh, one of my windows that I have open. And there's a fairly handy website here at uh, Oregon State. I will take and I'll copy this into your uh, email. Call this description of LA Pack routines. All right. So uh, it says there are three different types of LA Pack routines: simple, expert, and computational. Um, some of this, if you've taken a class in linear algebra, you may know some of this uh, terminology. But let's just click on the simple driver routines and see what we get. So we take a look at this and it says solves a general system of linear equations AX is equal to B. This is the simple driver over on the right hand side is the expert driver. And then um, there's different ones, a banded system that may, is often very handy in finite element analysis. There's different things, and it goes into some very, um, you know, some things that, that you really need to know what you're doing in order to use. Her, her, so I'll say Herme, Hermitian positive definite system of linear equations and so forth. But we are going to keep it simple. We're going to take a look at this first one, SGESV. Now, the way these things are named is S means single precision. D stands for double precision, C stands for complex, and uh, uh, Z, uh, I can't think of what Z is off the top of my head, but that's another set of uh, more complicated subroutines. We're going to look at the single precision one. So we're going to look at SGESV. And, and here is the synopsis. Now, since we downloaded and extracted our routines, See if I can find that. We can find this file. Uh, we said it was 
SGESV. So I'm going to scroll down here. I know that's going real fast. Okay, so there it is. SGESV.F. So I'm going to open this up. And it's a subroutine statement. All these are comments in the beginning. And I am going to copy that into my program. So this is my main program. This is where you will define the elements of your matrix. And I'm going to take and highlight all of this and do a copy and a paste into my main program. Now the next thing we need to do is need to see what the arguments of the routine are. Now this one says subroutine SGESV and it has all this stuff. So now we need to figure out what all this is. And it has it in this comment. Here's the arguments. Uh, N is an integer. It's the number of linear equations. It's the order of the matrix. So if I want to do a 2 by 2 matrix, I'm going to set N is equal to 2. The next thing it has, here's my call function. Next thing it has is NRHS. That's the number of right-hand side columns. If you have a single column on the right-hand side, you'll leave that as 1. Uh, a is our matrix. And for us, it'll be like our stiffness matrix. Mine is a 2 by 2. And here in my program is where I've declared my values for the matrix. Just uh, 1 on the diagonal. You have to declare all the elements. You never want to have an undeclared element because you don't know what bits are in that memory register. Okay, the next thing is LDA and L, uh, LDA. That's the um, order of the matrix again on the left hand side. Uh, it's going to be 2 for a 2 by 2 matrix. LDB is going to be defined as 2. This IPIV, that's an output from the subroutine, that's the pivot. The B. Uh, when we're solving the equation AX equal to B, we know what B is on the right-hand side. Now I'm just making this very simple. Um, 10.0 and minus 51.0. And then information is some diagnostic information that comes back from the subroutine. All right, so that, that looks pretty good. I've got it all kind of figured out here. So let's see what happens. I'm going to save this. And I'm going to try to compile it. I'm going to go into my compiling window. And uh, let's see, there it is, matrix1.for. So I'm going to go with G95, matrix1.for. See what happens. Okay. Oops. It says a non numeric character in statement label 1 in the file. All right, let's see what the problem is. Oh, look down here. I do not have this in the first column. Okay, so I'll get rid of that space. And now I'm going to save it. All right, let's compile it again. All right, oh, now I got some more errors. All right, it says an undefined reference to XERBLA, SGETRF, and S-G-E-T-R-S. If we look through here, those are additional subroutines that are called within the subroutine. So what I need to do is I need to find those things and I need to paste them on the bottom of this as well. And inside of each of those are some additional subroutines that you need to find out of the LA pack. Easy way to find these things like SGETRF is to use your Windows search function. Type in SGETRF. And here it is. I have it in a couple places now. You can just take this and you can copy and you can paste into a, a folder. Now, <clears throat> What you may have then at the end is a whole big folder full of these things. An easy way, so you don't have to cut and paste 15 different files into Crimson Editor, is you go into your collection of subroutines, 
and run a DOS command. Let me get into it here. Let me get rid of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in the command copy star.f to target.txt. And what that does is it will concatenate all of those files into this whoops one file. And now let me open it with Crimson Editor. and make it look nice. So all of these things now are in one file. And uh, what I have done for you is I have found all the ones for solving the matrix equation AX equal to B. And I will send that to you. And the name of my file is matrix. So if I open this file, matrix.for, it has what we have just defined earlier, plus all of the subroutines used for solving AX equal to B. Now, there may be other ways you want to solve equations or eigenvalue extraction. You would do the same sort of thing. But now let's go and compile matrix.for. Let's see if that works. G95 matrix.for. Oops, I got to get into my right folder. Now remember, it will write this as a.exe. So if you need to save that executable that you've already created, you need to do that before you compile again. All right, so I have no error messages. Doesn't mean my program's working right. That just means I don't have any errors uh, in the syntax. If I come over here, if I go do a directory, I see a.exe. And for my very simple matrix operation with ones on the diagonal, my right hand side equal to 10 and minus 51. Now I have uh, the output. If I make these equal to two, and I save this, and I recompile this, and I run it again with my diagonal elements equal to two, then my result is five and minus 25.5. Uh, and it's always a good idea to test any of these routines out uh, with uh, uh, some very simple known solutions before you, you get too far involved. And so uh, now we have a way to solve a system of uh, two equations and two unknowns. Just by changing in and defining more elements in our array, we can solve much larger matrix problems. And uh, we will do that uh, subsequently in class. That'll do it for this time. And uh, we'll talk more in class about setting up our finite element solution.